Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the store's events uh, director. Community Bookstore is celebrating over 50 years in business, and we credit the continued support of readers, writers, and translators for this milestone. So thank you all for spending the evening with us. I'm very thrilled today to be welcoming author Andrea Chapella and translator Kelsey Venata for the launch of The Visible Unseen, which was published today by our friends and neighbors at Restless Books. Um, now to some housekeeping before I properly introduce our guests. We've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, you can click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please quick, click on the Q&A button, which is also on the bottom of your screen. Um, you can submit them there and we'll be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's also a chat box, which I'll be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. And one caveat for tonight is all at the mercy of our own or our own home internet connection, so please bear with any technical issues that could arise. We will resolve them as quickly as we can. Um, Fall's a really exciting time for books, as you all know, and we have a really stellar lineup of in-person and virtual events for you. So head to our website, communitybookstore.net, sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I wanna point out in particular is this Thursday, October 13th, we're back again with Restless Books to welcome Tahitian novelist Tita Wapeyu and translator Jeffrey Zuckerman discussing the novel Pina. They'll be in conversation with novelist Nell Freudenberger. And next week on Wednesday, October 19th, George Saunders will be joining us in person at Congregation Beth Elohim to celebrate the release of his new book of short stories, Liberation Day, in conversation with Brandon Taylor. We hope you'll join us if you're here in New York and both of those programs are up on our website now, taking registrations. So now a little about tonight's guests and we will get started. Andrea Chapela has a degree in chemistry from the National Autonomous University of Mexico and an MFA in Spanish creative writing from the University of Iowa. She's the recipient of multiple awards, including the 2019 Jose Luis Martinez National Prize for Grados de Miopia. Uh, the full English translation of the book is out today um, as The Visible Unseen with Restless Books. Her stories have been published in the journals Tierra Adentro and Este País, as well as in various anthologies. In English translation, her publications include poems in the Brooklyn Rail in translation and an essay in Tupelo Quarterly. She was named one of Granta's best young Spanish language novelists in 2021 and lives in Mexico City. And Kelsey Venata is the author of the poetry chapbook Rare Earth, and her book length translations include The Visible Unseen um, and Damascus Atlantis, selected poems by Marie Silkeberg, which was long listed for the 2022 Penn Award for Poetry and Translation. Kelsey holds MFAs in poetry from the Iowa Writers Workshop and literary translation from the University of Iowa and works as the program manager of the American Literary Translators Association in Tucson, Arizona. She teaches occasional classes on literary translation and is an active reviewer of poetry and translation. So without any further ado, I will hand it off to you, Andrea, Kelsey, thank you both so much for joining us and congratulations. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, Community Bookstore, for hosting us today. It's a very special day for us, yeah. as the book is out today. Um, I just got my copies yesterday, <laughs> so it's it feels like it, it's the first time I'm having them in my hand. And uh, well, I'm going to start us. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit for those that were just curious about the cover of this book or maybe the name. Uh, what the book is about and what can you expect from us today. So The Visible Unseen is the translation from the Spanish of a book that I wrote. Um, this is my copy of that book, which is very used. Um, I adopted a kitten right after, the, the one you've seen, after I published this and she bite on it. But um, this is the Spanish version. And I worked on this book with a fellowship uh, during one, during uh, the 2017-2018 like school year uh, while I was living in Madrid. And it's a book that tries to marry or at least find common ground between literature and science. And in some ways to do that, I had to look at the history of science and I had to look at my own history the personal history I had, I, my parents are scientists, my sister is also one and I am one. Um, although I've never actually, <laughs> I have, it's been years since, and I, since I was in a lab for the last time. But science was the language of my childhood and youth and the way that my parents showed me the, way, the world. 
And when I decided to go to Iowa, where Kelsey and I met, and you'll hear, hear about that more later, when I decided to go to Iowa, I thought I was deciding to leave science behind and start writing and stop doing the other thing. But very quickly in Iowa, I realized that the language of science was something that was very important to me. And more than important, it came very natural to me. It was a way that I saw the world. And after my thesis in Iowa, which was a book about poems um, of science in of science and love, I guess, or on love, uh, heartbreak more, more to say, I, I started to think how to actually do the next step and not use science to convey something else, but look at science. And so the book is divided into three essays. Each essay has an object it revolves around. And I look at that object through the lens of science. And then I look at the science through the lens of poetry, I guess. So it's a stack of layers that keep revolving around each other and that have me maybe <laughs> in the middle. And to all of that, then Kelsey came and put her beautiful language into it to make me be shareable with everyone. And so what we are going to do is we're going to read from the second essay, which is called, um, what's it called in English? <laughs> ah, the act of seeing myself and it's looking at mirrors and we're going to read three parts of it, small parts, uh, but because we are reading both languages, first I'll read the Spanish and then Kelsey will read the English, we'll talk in between them. And when we have like 15 minutes uh, left, we'll welcome your questions. So uh, without much further ado, I'll start reading um, from this second essay. And so this is El Acto de Verse, Objeto de Estudio, Espejo. Puedo comenzar con mi primer espejo, un rectángulo alargado de aluminio y vidrio. Su marco de madera rojiza tallado con ondulaciones parece estar cubierto por hojas. Me contemplo a medias. De pie, solo de cintura para abajo, subida en una silla de rueditas de la cintura para, para arriba, en un balance precario. Lo compré en un viaje a San Miguel de Allende que hice a los 14 años. Todos mis ahorros a cambio de la oportunidad de mirarme. Me gustaría recordar ese deseo con detalle para escribirlo pero únicamente queda el objeto. Seis meses después de comprar ese espejo, regresé de la secundaria y fui directo a mi cuarto. Al principio no entendí que estaba mal. Salí y entré varias veces. Me di cuenta de que mi espejo no estaba. Hasta ese momento, había estado colgado entre la cama y el escritorio, alineado, alineado con la puerta. Cuando, le pregunté qué había pasado, cuando pregunté qué le había pasado a mi espejo, mi madre me contestó, que se había caído a media mañana con un estruendo. El marco estaba intacto y solo se había roto el cristal. Dijo que lo llevaría a arreglar. A la semana siguiente el espejo reapareció. Me di cuenta de que estaba allí por la misma razón por la que noté que había desaparecido. Me había acostumbrado a verme al cruzar la puerta, caminar hasta la cama, dejar la mochila. Ese día que llegué de la escuela no había echado de menos el objeto. Lo que faltaba en esa pared era mi reflejo. So I'll share the, the English for that um, excerpt that Andrea just read, but I wanted to say first uh, another thanks to Community Bookstore and um, also to Restless Books for, um, for just uh, supporting this book all the way through. We were just talking about how we've actually been working on it. Um, I've been working on the translation since 2018, so it's been um, a long time in the works and we're just really happy to be able to share it um, with you. So this is from the act of self-seeing, object of study, mirror. I could begin with my first mirror, a glass rectangle with an aluminum coating. The wavy shapes carved into its reddish wooden frame give it the effect of being covered in leaves. I regard myself in it. Standing, I can only see my reflection from the waist up. To see from the waist down, I have to balance precariously on my rolling desk chair. I bought the mirror on a trip I took to San Miguel de Allende when I was 14. All my savings in return for the privilege of looking at myself. I'd like to be able to recall my teenage desire in detail, but I can record it, but the object alone remains. Six months after buying the mirror, 
I came home from school and went straight to my room. At first, I didn't know what was wrong. I went back out and re-entered a few times, then realized my mirror wasn't there. It used to hang between the bed and the desk, lined up with the door. When I asked what had happened, my mother answered that the mirror had fallen that morning. The frame was intact, only the glass had broken. She said she'd take it to get it fixed. The mirror reappeared the next week. I realized it was there for the same reason I had noticed it was gone. I had become accustomed to seeing myself as I came through the door, crossed to the bed, dropped my backpack. The day my mirror disappeared, I didn't miss the object. What was absent from the wall was my reflection. So that's a, a first taste of this second essay. And we'll come back and, and read a couple more parts um, throughout our time this evening. But we thought we'd also have a bit of a conversation uh, among the two of us about um, this book and how it came to be. So I will, I will kick us off, um, Andrea, by asking you to tell us a little bit about uh, why these three objects of study, why, why glass, mirrors, and light? So the three objects, glass, mirror, and light, the third one was unexpected. In the beginning, I always thought I would write about glass, mirrors, and the eyes. And in some way, I liked that all of them had to do with seeing. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and it, it's more because of, I write with, I put limits and constraints uh, to myself when I write. And so the whole book started uh, at a class I was auditing in Iowa. And we were reading poetry. You were in that class too. <laughs> with which, Liz, which one? With Louise, when we were read uh, Latin American poetry. Oh, yeah. During, during the, our th third year. Um, I think it was your first year in translation. It was, yeah, that's right. And then um, we were in that class and we were reading, I don't remember exactly what poet we were reading, but we started talking uh, about metaphors in our language mm -hmm. and, then, and, our, and we, for, for some reason, we were talking about glass and I remember Googling something I, a uh, fact that I knew to make sure it was true. And I read it out loud. And the fact that is in the book is something like, that um, that we that we don't know if glass is solid or liquid. Mm. And when I said that, a guy in that class who is a poet, uh, Carlo, he told me, "Wow, that's beautiful." And it astounded me for so long because I thought it was amazing and I thought it was cool, but I didn't think it was beautiful. Mm. Not at that moment, and I couldn't understand why it was <laughs> beautiful. And, and so that's how it started. I, the biggest criticism I got during the defense of my thesis was that I had tried to make my poems so that it be, they'd be readable for uh, everyone who read poetry, but yeah. also that the science would work. Yeah. I was very adamant that I wanted the science to be true. And everyone, all of my professors were like, why? Mm. <laughs> Why do you put your cons that constraint? And it took me so long to be able to verbalize that it was because science wasn't just, science had meaning to me. The words not, were not just beautiful, they had so much meaning to them. And maybe that's why when I started thinking about the book I wanted to write, I knew I wanted to write a lyrical essay because I feel more comfortable <laughs> doing prose than doing verse. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to do this like fragmented form and then I started thinking, what are the objects? And I like that. I like that. Those were the trees that came to me first. Although then I, while I was researching stuff for the I essay, I came up, I ran into this book about the history of light and I just became enamored with it, with how it resonated so much with me that I just had to put everything aside and write <laughs> my own history of light. But I think all of it in the end is a way of me looking at different things and trying to look through a point of view that's just mine. And I think that's why, uh, maybe it's the discovery of my own point of view, but I think that's why I keep going back into my own history to be able to see these objects into how they became. And actually, while you were reading, 
I have that mirror still. It's hanging right in this wall That's by my great. side. The mirror of that first essay. And so that's how the book came to be. But um, you were just saying that we just to just started translating it in 2018. Why? <laughs> how did we get to translation? And I guess that also has to do with how we met and what, how we ended up here, which is, I think, a charming thing to explain. So why, Kelsey, did you translate this book? <laughs> why did I do it? Um, well, as as Andrea mentioned, we met in Iowa City, um, and we did have quite a number of classes together, and a couple of them were translation workshops. And I think maybe at that point you were you were translating some of your own, you were translating yourself, you were translating some of your own work from Spanish into English. Um, and we sort of found that that it worked really well um, for us to look at those together and to sort of co co translate some of your fiction. Um, and I worked on some of your poems as well. I remember those, those science heartbreak poems very well. Um, but we just, we just sort of found that there was a good, a good collaboration there, I think. Um, uh, and so at some point you shared the first essay with me, the first essay in this book, even before the book had been published. Um, and so I translated that first essay or a version of it, an earlier version of it actually. Um, and that was that, translation was published in Tupelo Quarterly. Um, and, uh, and I think was, yeah, well, well received. And I really, um, I just really enjoyed working on it. I enjoyed working with prose, even though I have mostly translated poetry. Um, so I just went from there. I worked on the second essay um, a year ago, and then the third essay at the beginning of this year to finish, to finish the book. Um, it's been a good collaboration all throughout. I think going into that collaboration, because wants to be part of this. Um, she, she's welcome, we love her. She gets feisty. Um, talking about that collaboration, it, it's been very interesting to me because I, I've learned so much about my own writing through having to talk to you about it. And also I, I learned so much about how to, what I care about <laughs> yeah. when, people are, when, when I am writing. Um, so for me, it's been very interesting, like realizing that sometimes what I needed to tell you is not that you get Spanish very well, but what I needed to tell you is the images in my head. Okay. <laughs> it's like, this is what I was thinking. This right. is the image I have. And now you can do with it whatever you want. And yeah. so I think the translation, you did it all on your own, but it was very collaborative in the fact that, that I think there were many spaces for you to be creative. Well, translation is a creative art, but more so. Um, so I wanted, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. I think I always found that interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a translation is a very creative act for me um and uh and i think one thing that works about it for me is um similar to something you mentioned that you gave yourself a kind of constraint or a um kind of a prompt in which to work and and translation feels like that to me that it's kind of a, a prompt to start from or a constraint in which to to write and be creative and sometimes in writing poems as well, that's um, that actually helps me to have a kind of constraint and somewhere to, to start from. Um, so nonfiction is certainly is certainly newer for me, but um, but there were many many parts in which I felt that there was a lot of that I had a lot of um, creativity. So one example that comes to mind is um, in this essay on mirrors just the sort of wealth of terminology in English for, um, for seeing, for vision, for sight, for, but also for, um, for reflection and for, for contemplation. Um, and so I, I tried to really, you know, sort of use the full, um, use the, the full power of, of English to vary the terms that we used in that, in that essay. So regard myself um, for example, or, or contemplate, um, not to use, you know, look at myself every time. Um, 
And then there were there were some aspects. Um, I think it was in the yes in the first essay where, um, you know, there are certain sections of that first essay that are that are very much like poetry to me. Um, there's one where you're talking about um, after the 2017 earthquake, um, the Puebla earthquake that also affected Mexico City. You're talking about how um, everything breaks. You say and and there's a list of things that kind of break in your experience as you're trying to describe the, you know, the, tr the trauma of that moment. And, um, and you were the one who encouraged me to not really translate that part so literally, but to think about what goes with the word break in English. Um, and, you know, breaking, breaking habits was one thing that came to me that's not actually in the Spanish, but, um, but it seemed like the right move in in terms of what that essay is trying or what that section is trying to achieve, um, what breaks down in that moment. So definitely lots of lots of creative um, moments for me. Uh, and maybe we should share another one. We read that next. Yes. Section. Podría comenzar hoy, 29 de diciembre. De noche, entre semana, las calles entre el lavapiés y la latina, donde el rastro se instala los domingos, están prácticamente vacías. Me cruzo con algunos niños que juegan a la pelota en una plaza, con personas de pasos apurados y mirada baja que regresan del trabajo, y con grupos de hombres cargando al hombro sus mantas llenas de bolsas y zapatos, hablando en idiomas que no conozco. Doy vueltas. Evito sacar el celular y exploro las callejuelas tratando de llegar a Tirso de Molina pero sin estar segura de cuál es la dirección correcta. Tan lejos de la Ciudad de México, disfruto del privilegio de caminar sola de noche. Me detengo a tomar fotos, me asomo a algunos de los escaparates oscuros, me entretengo en cada plaza. Entre Navidad y Año Nuevo, Madrid se halla en, un estado, en una extraña calma. Al dar la vuelta, en, una, en otra callejuela empinada y curvilínea, me encuentro con algunas guacales rotos y dos espejos en pedazos. Me observo en los trozos que quedan apoyados en la pared. Las, figura, las fisuras fragmentan mi imagen. Mis piernas en un segmento, un brazo en otro, mi cara a medias más allá. Los romanos creían que el espejo mostraba tu alma y que si lo rompías, también resquebrajabas una parte de ti. Los siete años de mala suerte que se, se achacaban a quien rompía un espejo eran los años que tardaba el alma romana en reponerse. Me pregunto qué superstición tendrían para un clavo que cede y un espejo que se rompe sin culpables. Tal vez la confusión al no encontrar mi imagen ese día al volver de la escuela en realidad era la reacción de una persona con el alma agrietada. ¿Se habrá repuesto al cambiar el cristal? ¿Qué se pierde en esos casos? Hay algo inquietante en un espejo roto abandonado en la calle. Un ataque personal. I could begin today, December 29th. On weeknights, the streets between Lava Pies and La Latina, where El Rastro Market is set up on Sundays, are practically empty. I run into a few kids playing ball in a plaza, people with lowered eyes hurrying home from work, and groups of men shouldering their blankets full of handbags and shoes to sell, talking in languages I don't understand. I walk in circles. I avoid taking out my phone and instead explore the narrow streets as I try to reach the Tirso de Molina Plaza unsure which direction to take. Far from Mexico City, I relish the privilege of walking alone at night. I stop to take pictures, peer into dark display windows, enjoy myself in each plaza. Between Christmas and New Year's, Madrid lies under a strange calm. As I turn around in yet another steep, narrow, curving street, I come across some broken crates and two shattered mirrors. I eye myself in the pieces still leaning against the wall. Their, their cracks fragment my image, my legs in one segment, my arm in another, half of my face over there. The Romans believed that mirrors revealed your soul and that if you broke one, you also splintered a piece of yourself. The seven years of bad luck ascribed to whoever broke a mirror were the years, were the number of years it took the Roman soul to heal. I wonder what superstition they would have about a nail that gives way and a mirror that breaks on its own. Maybe the confusion I felt when I got home from school that day to find my reflection missing was, in fact, the reaction of a person with a cracked soul. 
Did replacing the glass repair it? What gets lost in these instances? There's something disquieting about a broken mirror abandoned in the street, a personal attack. So maybe this is um, a good moment for us to, to talk a little bit about that time that you spent in Madrid. Um, it's, uh, it's very special for me that I was also there for a few months with you and got to see the places that, um, that you describe and got to wander some of these same streets and plazas. Uh, and I also got to see your workspace in La Residencia de Estudiantes. Um, I remember, for example, that you had um, all of these note cards with different quotes and sort of your, um, your, your sketch, your outline of the book um, stuck up across one wall with tape. Um, you're very organized in that way with, with the note cards. But um, yeah, maybe you wanna talk a little bit about, about what being in Madrid meant to you and meant to this book um, or about these quotes that structure it. I can talk a little bit about both. So my, my time in my grave was a gift. In the end, I spent two years there and I wrote two books. Uh, and it was one of those residencies where everything is taken care for. And so the only thing you have to do is write, which is very, very hard <laughs> when you can't, but it's yeah. wonderful when you can. And about the process, I am very obsessed <laughs> with figuring out my own process, not necessarily to recreate it. I don't mean, uh, I don't need to have a certain pen or a certain notebook or things like that but I want to understand how my own head, my own mm. mind works while I, when mm. I'm trying to write. And I hadn't figured that out when I was trying to write this book. What I had figured out it was that, because it was a form that it was weird, like it was the first time I was trying it out, that I needed a certain um, process to it. And I guess that's my scientific mind. Yeah. <laughs> it's doing an experiment and then it has to trace it and understand what is working in it. And so every essay in the book required somehow like three months, maybe a month and a half of research, mm. which meant research into the object, but also research into the form, just reading a ton of uh, lyrical essays that I liked and that I found or someone um, told me about to try to find a form that would speak to me or echo. The first one is clearly calling back to Bluets by Maggie Nelson. Um, but then there are others in the different, in the, the, the other essays are calling to other books too. And, and then once I had the form and once I had all my scientific facts, I had to start writing and it came, it was very hard in the beginning, the, in fact, uh, one of the questions I had when I started writing the first essay about glass, and I remember talking to a friend about it, I told his, to him, the hardest part is I don't know when a section is done. I don't know how to tell when a section is done. And then he said, well, just pick something random, <laughs> decide something, like uh, decide something external to tell you when that section is done. And I thought about it a lot, and then I said, well, if the, that, that first essay of a glass is about um, the states of matter, if, if, if glass, the big question that has no answer, spoilers, <laughs> humanity doesn't know is if glass is a solid or a liquid. So it talks a lot about the state of matter. And so I said, okay, so I'm going to select something that is solid, something that is liquid, something that is gas. Um, in, in, and every, in, in each part has to have the three things. So the solids were my science, my scientific facts. The liquid were my personal facts, the things that were more emotional mm. and close to me. And the gas was everything that were like flourishes of languages or like something that I was trying to make. So when I was <laughs> more vulnerable, I think that's not the word I want, <laughs> but that could fly away, I guess. Mm. And, and, I looked at everything I had until that moment and decided which ones had the three of them. And if they didn't, I would add something. And in the final stage of editing the book, I, I read them again without thinking and so many of the, and I dismantled it again. <laughs> so 
not all the pieces are like that anymore, but it was very good to have those kinds of process um, or like ways to tell myself to be confident in what I was doing, yeah. even if by the end of it, I will read it through with just wanting it to be to sound nice. And so, well, you've seen this, I have a like a big folder for each of the essays that has every quote, every thought, every thing I was <laughs> thinking about or that I found that inspired me and everything was in my wall. And I will, the process of like making the essay, figuring out how it would flow from, that was also really, it was one of the fun, the parts that were the most fun for me. <laughs> and so that's how it looked. I had the best, in Madrid, I had the best desk a writer can ask for. It, like that <laughs> desk has been designed for writers. And so it was a pleasure to be able to, to work there. Yeah. And, and so I wanted to ask you about more about the act of translating. Um, so you don't know any science. <laughs> oh, well, you do. Hey. But it's not really. <laughs> Not much, you're right. <laughs> so how was that to have, the book is science heavy and not maybe in a way that uh, left readers out, but in a way that you have to get so many things. So yeah. I, I, I guess I am, I don't know, tell me if I'm wrong. I'm, am I correct in to say that one of the challenges of the book is to get not only the terminology, but the ideas of the mm -hmm. science? Um, so how was having to have a crash course? <laughs> in science for you doing this? Yeah, it really, um, you're right. I mean, I have very little uh, science background um, beyond uh, high school chemistry, um, but I guess I'll say a, a couple of things. One is that um, a lot of research also went into, I mean, I think I, I think I probably more or less recreated the research that or a lot of the research that you did, um, because of because of trying to ground my language, the language I was using in English, in in the correct science. So um, so uh, thanks to you, I I you pointed me toward a lot of the the actual articles that you had used, or toward their you know a, a Wikipedia page in English. Um, you sent YouTube videos showing me how uh, some of these chemical, some of the experiments that you did in your chemistry labs, you sent videos of those, which was really helpful um, because yeah, I did have the sense that I needed to make sure that I understood what was happening, that I could see what, what you're describing to be able to put it into correct, into correct English. But it's, but it's maybe also a good example of, um, of how you don't have to be, I didn't have to be an expert already in those, you know, in what you're describing scientifically. I just needed some tools of research and, and I'm grateful for your, your help and your collaboration on some of those. Um, but yeah, definitely a lot of, a lot of really digging into uh, articles online, trying to sort of get my head around quantum mechanics. That's, that was a real, that was a real change for me. Um, and, and I think the, another, another aspect of the science that was really difficult was the, was the whole mirror section. You describe what actually is happening, how a mirror is actually working. And I think at some point you and I kind of agreed that the more you read about mirrors and try to understand them, actually the weirder they are. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was it was a lot of work, but um, but it was also kind of a delight to to be in a very different headspace and to um, yeah, to sort of like be digging through all of all of English's possibilities in these articles that I would never otherwise access. I think it's fascinating what you just said, the fact that the more you read about mirrors, the weirder they are, because I think that's true of the three objects. The more I read, I read about glass, there was like, how is, I think it, it might surprise people that we don't know. It's like everyone would say glass is solid. And then when you know, no, it's it's not that easy. It doesn't, it seems as solid, but it's not in the way that um, you think your reflection is yourself, but it's not. And yeah. the way that you think that light is something we understand why we have no idea what it actually is. And it's so many things at the same time and how it's played 
I think one of the things that fascinates me about science is how much, I don't know, in the end for me, they are quite close, uh, the kinds of questions that science and art are asking, even if yeah. we are approaching them in very different ways. In the end, it's just like looking and being overwhelmed in, in all <laughs> of what's around us and just yeah. having to try to talk your way through it, <laughs> I guess. So tell me, did I convince you? Is science beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> you definitely convinced me. Yeah, the science is, is very beautiful. Um, and I really, yeah, one of the sort of big themes of the book that I love so much is how you talk about um, just the, that there is so much that, that we really can't express. Scientific language is sometimes lacking. And also, you know, the poetic language, the metaphors that we might try to use um, to describe something, you know, we're always sort of grasping at uh, a description of what we experience in the world around us, but that that's actually beneficial and beautiful because it, it sort of pushes us to, to innovate. Um, so yeah, I guess one last thing I wanted to ask you, and then maybe we'll, maybe we can read the last piece um, is, uh, you know, with that idea in mind, that words are not always very precise, that sometimes math, mathematics, you know, is more, comfor more comfortable in precision um, than language. Uh, maybe could you talk a little bit about that? Did you, you know, did you come to some kind of ability to, uh, did you get to the precision and the accuracy you're hoping for in language? Um, it is a theme of the book, how I keep repeating all the time. And I sometimes double down, like I, I, I think I'm over it, but there are sometimes in my day to day when I think I wish, I wish I could just say what I want to say, like <laughs> that I could be just as precise as one can be. Um, but at the same time, writing the book, I think what it, it, I came in the end, I didn't know. I, I'm a writer to study writing because she was fascinating with plots, not with words, which I mm. think it's one of the other ways of getting into writing. But I never knew how fascinated I was with words until I wrote this book, which I guess I was, but I didn't know. But I, I became very fascinated with the, fact, with the fact that words are so imperfect, mm. but it's everything we have. And I don't know if we want, I think if they were as precise of math, if, if I could, because the thing with math is math allows us to say if something is true or is false, it's clear. But language doesn't allow that. There is nothing that is completely true. You, you cannot express your feelings in exactly the same way you are feeling them. You can only try. But I think if we could talk with the precision of math, we wouldn't need literature. <laughs> we wouldn't need metaphors and we wouldn't need poetry. And I think that would be a shame. But I think because I think there is something very human and very beautiful in, in trying something that you know is going to fail and to just keep trying to yeah. be understood, to be seen, to understand someone else and that we are doing it with the tools we have and that we've created so much around the fact that we want the other person to understand us. So I... I think I came out of this book not wanting the precision of math anymore, hmm. but actually being like understanding that that thing, that language is so imperfect, is something I'm going to keep writing about because of how, of all the ways that all the things that we have made with that imperfection and all the things that come to go through our fingers and through the cracks of language. Hmm that we are just trying to grasp, I think. So I'll read the last section. Okay. And then when we come back, we'll get to the, we have one question from the audience, but if you, while we're reading, anyone wants to have any more, um, throw any more questions at us, please do. Podría comenzar con Jacques Lacan, quien describió el comportamiento de los niños al encontrarse con su reflejo. Llamó estadio del espejo, a la fase del desarrollo psicológico infantil cuando uno empieza a reconocer su propia imagen. Los niños reaccionan con júbilo, pero esta primera identificación, nos dice Lacan, es imaginaria. El reflejo nos presenta una imagen completa que nunca seremos capaces de ver sin su ayuda. Esto afecta a la construcción de nuestra identidad. 
Philip Rochat propone que la autoconciencia se forma entre los seis meses y los cinco años a través de cinco etapas. Eso es un espejo. En él hay una persona. Esa persona soy yo. Esa persona siempre voy a ser yo. Y lo que veo es lo mismo que otros ven al verme. A veces tengo mañanas en las que vuelvo a sufrir el proceso entero. Esa persona soy yo. La imagen me desconcierta. Esa persona siempre voy a ser yo. No la reconozco, no embona con la idea difusa de lo que soy en mi mente. Lo que veo es lo mismo que otros ven al verme. Me parece tan injusto que otros conozcan mi imagen mejor que yo. Lacan dice que la disociación ante el espejo proviene de distinguir nuestra imagen como fragmentos. Unas manos en el teclado, un torso frente al escritorio, unas piernas que desaparecen bajo la mesa. Estoy tan cerca de mí que es difícil distinguir de todo el todo que formo. Cualquier idea que tenga de mí misma es imaginaria. Esto me produce impotencia. Me gustaría pensar que me conozco, pero desde el principio, en lo más obvio, encuentro un límite. Así que me concentro en todos los espejos con los que me he cruzado y en las distintas versiones de mi reflejo. Le doy, una nueva, le doy un nuevo significado a la experiencia. A veces, mientras escribo, pierdo el hilo, dudo si funciona y necesito recurrir a una mirada externa. Con la misma vulnerabilidad de quien pregunta, ¿tengo comida en los dientes? O, ¿se me nota que he llorado? Pregunto, ¿ves este texto como lo veo yo? I could begin with Jacques Lacan, who described how children react when they first encounter their own reflection. He gave the name mirror stage to the phase of an infant's psychological development when they begin to recognize their own likeness. Children react to mirrors with glee, but this first self-identification, Lacan tells us, is imaginary. Without the help of reflections, seeing our full image would be impossible, and this affects how our identity is formed. Philippe Rochat proposed that self-awareness is developed between the ages of six months and five years in five levels. That is a mirror. In it is a person. That person is me. That person will always be me. What I see is the same thing others see when they see me. Some mornings I suffer through this entire process again. I am that person. What I see unsettles me. That person will always be me. I don't recognize her. She doesn't fit my vague idea of who I am in my mind. What I see is the same thing others see when they see me. It seems so unfair that other people know what I look like better than I do. Lacan says the dissociation we feel when we look in the mirror comes from the way we perceive our own likeness in pieces. Hands on a keyboard, a torso at a desk, legs disappearing under the table. This close to myself, I can hardly grasp the whole I make up. Every idea I have of myself is imaginary, which makes me feel helpless. I'd like to think I know myself, but even in this most basic aspect of who I am, I come up against an obstacle. So I think through all the mirrors I've ever encountered and their different versions of my reflection. I try to endow the experience with fresh significance. As I'm writing, I sometimes lose the thread of what I'm trying to articulate, question whether it's working, and feel the need to draw on an external gaze. With the same vulnerability of someone asking, do I have food in my teeth? Or does it look like I've been crying? I ask, do you see this text as I see it? All right, so we have a two-part question from the audience and we welcome additional questions, but I think we could probably talk, for this, uh, talk about this one for a while. Uh, so I'll read it out here. Two-part question first for Andrea, what was the experience like of reading your work in translation? And for Kelsey, what was the translation process like since you know Andrea so well? Does it differ from translating an author you don't know as well or at all? You start. There is, I think, an exercise in detachment <laughs> when you publish a book, but also when you get translated. Because it'll never be, it can be, the act of translation means it'll never be your words. Um, but I feel close to it. I feel. I feel seen through Kelsey's translation a lot. And I also, 
as I said, I was a writer that started with plots, which means I'm a writer that is very peculiar <laughs> in particular about their, her structures, about how a paragraph work or the inner workings and the decisions mm -hmm. that made me write something, but I'm not as attached to my own words. <laughs> um, so I don't mind when she changes things or when, and I actually think I sound smarter and <laughs> better in English. Um, so everything, if you read, and it, that's a strange thing about translation because in a way you want to be able to read the author, but you are always reading the author through someone else. Mm. Um, and I don't know, I think I'm very lucky that I get to, there's someone that I, that I'm being read to is someone that, yeah, that I have such a good relationship with. Um, but yeah, there is something very lovable about the whole thing. Um, Aaron, the translation teacher we both had, used to say that there will be no one to raise you as closely as your translator, right? That it, they would be the person who knows all your quirks and all the things and, they are going to be the person that gets closer to how your mind works. Or if you can get close, they'll try to imagine it. They'll spend many hours trying to imagine how your mind works. And I think that's a gift to, to have someone do that. Um, and being translated at Kelsey was a gift in that sense, in the sense that I, I got to experience it with her. <laughs> she, she opened the process and now we have a whole a whole way of that we do things and that we both like and that and I, I also understood what kind of my what comments of mine could help and that's nice too like that I could tell her like I think I can think of these phrases or sometimes I say yeah. things like this is why I imagined in English when I wrote this <laughs> which happens with the title uh, when we were the title was very hard to translate and when we were thinking about it I said I always thought this book needed to be called this that's the title I wanted. The first title I ever wanted was this, but I couldn't retranslate it into Spanish. So I, because it has, it makes no sense in Spanish. So I had to find a new title in Spanish, but can we go to this first thing? <laughs> and so I think that's nice. It feels like mine in many ways and far away in very nice ways too. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's, that's really lovely. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you can probably tell this was not an easy book to translate, but but um, but you are very easy to work with, um, you know, and I think our friendship does affect that, um, the way in which we work together. You know, sometimes I, I fire off text messages and Andrea, you know, comes back and, and helps me kind of think of something I hadn't thought of before. Um, so that's really useful to me as a translator. Um, so I spoke a little bit about the translation process already, but, um, and does it differ from translating an author? I don't know as well. Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, I, I think that working with Andrea gives me a lot of confidence as a translator because she is so willing to, um, to jump in and sort of like make suggestions or, or to describe things so that I can see them in a different way in order to come up with the right or, you know, good language for them in English. So I think that, you know, translating a book that, that does have a lot of scientific concepts in it, I felt more confident to do that with Andrea by my side. Um, and yeah, it's interesting to, to do that, to have that relationship in a book that is about mirroring and reflection that we get to kind of create these two versions that somehow speak to each other. Um, yeah, I guess that's what I would say. The other thing I wanted to say about, about um, translation is, is that it seems to me that it, it's different from creative writing in that when you're writing creatively, you sometimes get, you, you're, you sort of allow, um, or you can be a little bit guided by like something kind of intangible, right? Or you can compose kind of intuitively. This is something that uh, Gitanjali Shri described in her recent keynote address for Pen Translates. Um, and she was talking about how the, the writer could kind of compose intuitively. The translator needs to come and understand absolutely everything and 
kind of get it all clear and sometimes have to ask the writer questions that might make them uncomfortable, like, what were you thinking here? Or what did you mean by this? And why, and does, why doesn't this make sense? <laughs> So, so I felt, you know, comfortable with Andrea to ask those kinds of questions, especially knowing that she is so careful with her process that she would, you know, have helpful answers to, to that. Um, so maybe we can look at another question here. Uh, you mentioned the, the title, but there's a question here about, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the cover image and the artwork in the book and how it relates to the text? And we should definitely make sure that we talk about that a little bit. Do you want to start? Yes. So this is a beautiful cover. And the images they are referring to are these wonderful images um, that are all photographies, uh, photograms by Fabiola Menkeli, an author I'm good friends with. And she did all of this for us because um, after I wrote the book in Spanish and it came out in Spanish, uh, early 2020, just before the pandemic, um, I got an offer to write a book with a visual artist, <laughs> Fabiola, because she had read my work and wanted to work with me. And so that started a collaboration um, that became a book called uh, on, on Unfolding, unfolding in English. <laughs> yes, which Kelsey translated too. And so we made the book in Spanish and it's, I don't have a copy by me right now, but it's also a very beautiful book that's also in English and in Spanish. Um, and that was the first thing the three of us somehow collaborated. And so when, when this book only has one, it, because it's a, it's published by the government in a governmental um, seal, it only gets one run, like it cannot be reprinted. And so she always told me like, if you ever get it reprinted, I need, I want to make the cover from it. So when, <laughs> when we started looking at covers, I said, I really would like if Fabiola could make the cover. And she sent us so many images. And this actually is an old image she made when she was in her MFA, which is also very special because she also did her MFA in the US and we bonded a lot about that. And then she gave us this, the black and white images to use inside. And the one I showed you last, every, every essay starts with one of her images. This is my favorite one <laughs> of all the ones I've seen by her. And she's great. She's great. And I feel very lucky that I have her. I have a friend that she allowed us to use all her images and that now we have two books that are done by the three of us. I don't know. I think that's special. Um, I was just reading, uh, while you were reading the, the acknowledgments, <laughs> because I forgot what I didn't say. And one of the things it, that says is that Fabiola showed me that art is an open conversation and that you create something in the world so that you can go to someone else and hopefully tell create something. And that sometimes it's like a spiral. And so you come back in, and then I would have never met Fabiola and worked with her if I hadn't written Girls in Yopia. And then we, and then it felt like very clear that she needed to be in this book too. So yeah. I like that a lot. I do too. And I, I like how having um, visual art in the book provides one more avenue for the reader to kind of test out what it is that you propose in the book, to, to think about, um, this question of you know, are uh, you know is our is our expression somehow limited and imperfect and imprecise? Um, you know, is it beautiful to try to live in this kind of in between? Um, I think that that having those there provides one more avenue to to think about. Um, yeah, to think about your your thoughts on metaphor. So we're getting close to running out of time, um, but there's just yeah, did you there are two questions. Say? I can answer okay. one about others. One about philosophy. <laughs> That's hard. But they also ask about visual artists. So, of course, Fabiola is a great inspiration. And I talk a lot about visual artists, a lot of kinds of artists um, in the book, like how good it uh, was so obsessed with light. Like I was, um, there is a Mexican artist called Gabriel Dos, I think. Mm -hmm. It's here in the book. Um, 
So I discovered his work when I was looking at, when I, Gabriel Dawe, when I was writing the book and I thought it's a lot in conversation with, he makes like rainbows made out of um, thread, colorful thread. But then there's also, I talk a lot about paintings, about going to, mm -hmm. to go see paintings in El Prado um, and how that was. And I don't know, there's so much that intermingles, right? Like architecture and light and photography. The, the book I wrote with Fabiola is about that, about photography and um, how photography is in the middle of being a technique and art and a science and how all of it, uh, it's like in the middle of that Venn diagram. So I think there are a lot of them, but Gabriel Dawe is one of them. And talking about the philosophers, so I'm not very good with philosophy. I have like just, I had a philosophy course in, in college, but I just move around them. Oh, more is, is the kinds of questions sometimes I ask myself or that I bump into when I'm writing requires me to go and read people. So I'm not so familiar. I know that Spinoza was a glass grinder, but I don't know much of his thought. Um, um, and I think for this book, I quote more scientists that sound like philosophers than I do actual philosophers. Um, it's more how how I, I start, like the people I, I find when I'm researching, but the book has so many dark corners, I think. And then you can answer the last one. I'll answer the last question, which is, um, are you collaborating on any other projects now? Uh, and actually we don't have anything that we're currently at the moment working on, um, but, we, but we have plans to. Uh, I think that we will, yeah, Andrea is a quite a prolific writer and is always working on something new. So I feel confident that, um, that she'll be writing something that, that I would like to, you know, really dig in and spend a lot of time translating in the near future. <laughs> Yes. We hope so, and we've got this beautiful work in the meantime to uh, to to enjoy. So thank you both so much for this really wonderful conversation. This has been a, a real joy to listen to, um, and congratulations again on the publication of The Visible Unseen. So exciting. Um, those of you at home, please consider purchasing a copy of The Visible Unseen from Community Bookstore or your favorite local indie. The link is in the chat. We hope to see you at another virtual event very soon. Thanks again for joining us, and have a great evening. Thanks, Noah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Good night. Bye.